Thank you for that talk. Next talk is uh, from our research training fellow at CMC Luthiana, Dr. Do Dorcas Gandhi. She'll be talking to us about stroke rehabilitation for upper limb impairments reaching the unreached in India. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I thank the India Alliance for giving me this opportunity. Um, I work at CMC Ludhiana. I'm an associate professor there and a research training fellow from the Wellcome Trust. Um, the topic might look a little confusing for those who are not from the field, but to simplify it, we are just trying to apply an interesting computer game-based rehabilitation platform that we developed with the University of Manitoba uh, to not only assess, but also intervene uh, to treat uh, upper limb impairments, that is impairments of the arm and the hand for those with stroke. That is where I am from. Just to understand the burden, and uh, I think I'll be taking off from uh, my previous uh, speaker here, NCD stroke being one of it, 10.3 million new strokes per year according to the GBD data. And we have 103 uh, million dallies per year, the disability adjusted life years. 80% of these patients show upper limb impairments and only up to 20% of them show complete functional recovery, meaning that we have the rest of them who are completely dependent on their caregivers or either moderately or minimally dependent on their caregivers. The Indian statistics show that 20.7% 20, uh, only go back to the condition that they were before with respect to their job, leaving again an 80%, a large 80% of stroke survivors sitting at home with the potential of recovery, but not, poss not being able to do their functional activities on their own. Again, stress on the caregivers as well as the family. This is where stroke rehabilitation comes in. And we understand by the various uh, studies that are done across the world that a multidisciplinary approach uh, proves the best, uh, proves as an antidote for these uh, patients who are lying at home doing nothing but with the recovery of poten uh, potential of recovery, I'm sorry. So this includes uh, with the team leader being led by uh, the neurologist, the physiatrist, and those coming in contact with the patient first, uh, followed by the other uh, members that are listed out here on the board. How do we deliver this therapy and why is it so important? I've just summarized in the next slide a few of the ways that we see. The landmark trial, the AVERT trial, spoke of how early can rehabilitation start. It has to start in the acute phase is what has been proven over the decades uh, for stroke uh, rehabilitation. What AVERT uh, gave, information uh, AVERT gave us was that the first 24 hours Mobilization in the first 24 hours is going to be going to prove detrimental to stroke patients, be it any form of stroke. So we have a landmark there, 24 hours and later. If it is an outpatient department-based rehabilitation uh, session that we are targeting at, we have various uh, guidelines and protocols that NICE has come up with, the WHO has come up with, so I will not be uh, going into that field. It's a huge topic in itself. Coming to low and middle income countries, the whole question of the unreached 80% of the population who are sitting at home with the potential of recovery. What do we do about them? Do we have enough uh, multidisciplinary team uh, reaching out to this population? Do we have enough physiotherapists reaching out to this population? Do we have all of these 80% of population who are aware, uh, are they aware of the rehab uh, benefits of rehabilitation? Do they, even if they are aware, do they come to access these facilities? To answer all these questions, we had uh, the RECOVER trial being conducted in India and China. Then we had the ATTEND trial, which uh, tried to empower the volunteers from society. And in case of RECOVER trial, we had the nurse-led uh, uh, rehabilitation trials, uh, which proved to be slightly significant. Although in the ATTEND trial, uh, which we were part of, um, this was the first largest rehabilitation trial in Asia with 1,250 patients, which is quite a lot for a rehabilitation trial. If you see the other papers, you will see 30 or 40 or 100. We had 1,250 patients here across 14 sites in India. Um, in, in, the, in the intervention package, what we did was the professional qualified physiotherapists trained the um, uh, caregivers of the patients. Um, 
to various ways uh, by simplifying the rehabilitation strategies that we use uh, in the ho starting from the hospital itself which followed into uh, the home uh, based care where the supervised training session continued where the physiotherapist visited the, the home and after two months uh, to contact was taken off uh, in the hope that we had empowered them enough uh, to continue rehabilitation uh, till the patient required it. This was based on the task shift approach that WHO talks about that um, various countries follow where a qualified person is training an unqualified, uh, sorry to say, a not a trained person um, to see if more number of people can be reached out to. Surprisingly, attend trial had gave us neutral results, saying that supervised sessions, supervised by a qualified physiotherapist or a qualified rehabilitation worker is the necessity. So that the intensity of rehabilitation can be stuck to as well as the patient's adherence and compliance can increase or at least remain stable over the long period of therapy that patients will require. I will talk about tele-rehabilitation at a later stage. Talking, we talk about, talked about how we deliver therapy. Let's talk about what do we exactly deliver here. There are a lot of modes. I'll be uh, sticking to the motor aspect of uh, stroke rehabilitation. It is proven and known and even as the um, Dr. Hegde yesterday mentioned uh, about neuroplasticity, to ta tap in that potential of neuroplasticity of the brain, the therapy sessions need to be intense and uh, repetitive. The protocols need to be intense. And by intense, I mean not just the number of repetitions that they're doing in each session, but the duration as well. We have cases where the patients have come for therapy up to eight um, to 12 months after the onset of stroke. And that's how intense we need therapy sessions to be to show some improvement in motor outcomes. Uh, this has been proven in uh, animal models, especially in rats where the brain derived neurotropic factor uh, has kicked in and uh, new axonal connections have been formed and formation of new, formation and proliferation of the dendritic spines have been seen in rat models with intense uh, repetitive protocols. Based on this, I don't know, how many of us are soccer fans here? Football fans, anybody? Okay, neither, oh, okay, we have one. Sorry, I'm not a fan, but then I just heard this somewhere. Um, a reporter goes to uh, um, Ronaldo and says, um, how do you find, what is your experience with soccer? And Ronaldo responds by saying that I believe that God sent me to show the world how soccer is played. And, this <laughs> and the same uh, reporter or the journalist goes to Messi and asks, so what do you have to say about this, that your contemporary is saying such a thing? So he says, I don't remember sending Ronaldo to the world to do this. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> every therapist believes that his approach is uh, the best approach to train the patient. I'll be talking about three of them, one of which we are using in our, uh, in our study uh, at CMC Ludhiana, the three of them which have class two evidence. Sadly speaking, we have no class one evidence for rehabilitation protocols and that is where we are heading, uh, hoping to head to with our, uh, third, uh, the one that I'll be speaking about. Uh, the first one is constraint induced movement therapy where uh, in the picture you see it's a little barbaric in nature I believe so I do not follow this for my patients um, <laughs> where you limit the use of the unaffected limb the normal limb by a mitt or either by tying it around the trunk and you are forcing the affected limb to work uh, in the functional activities and you're training the patient that way. Uh, now this is rigorous a traditional CIMT approach uh, asks uh, the patient to restrict their limb for 90% of the waking hours. Well, I wouldn't do it I, and I wouldn't suggest it, but there are modified um, protocols where they shorten the du time duration but increase the amount of work being done during that shortened time. So that is a possibility. This has class two evidence. But the question remains on how many patients are willing to get this done? Those data are very poor. The second type is mirror therapy. Again, class three evidence, I'm sorry. Yeah, class three evidence. It shows um, here we are using the normal limb to uh, do movements. Uh, in front of a mirror and the image, the mirror image of those movements is perceived by the patient as the movement of the affected limb which uh, triggers the mirror neurons in the brain, the corpus callosum in the brain and improves uh, motor outcomes. The third, there are various other approaches but I'll go to the third approach which we partly we are using in our study here, virtual rehab and robotics. Sounds very interesting and I'm guilty of playing a lot of video games when we came up with the protocol that we are using for our study right now. Uh, it can be as simple as playing a video game on screen with a motion sensor on your hand or if you're treating the limb, uh, the lower leg, then on your limb, accelerometers, gyroscopes where it can, um, you know, identify your, the position of your hand in space, position of your feet, a lot of uh, variations. It, two, uh, it, th these are simple ones. 
You have complex ones as well, where the patient is actually introduced into a virtual environment and functional activities there are being trained, like introducing him into, in this case, uh, if you see the picture, <coughs> I'm sorry, into a park on a treadmill where the, there are inclinations made and uh, different gait styles are uh, trained. And more uh, complex virtual rehab and robotics where you have uh, the external robotics added to the arm which assists the patient with producing enough torque, enough speed, enough range so that the patient is able to do some form of functional activity and use the unaffected limb. Yes, these are various pictures. <coughs> so what we have done in our study is simplified this virtual rehab, making it less expensive and easier to do in a small space in countries like India where you do not have uh, enough space or uh, uh, enough money to put into these large virtual rehab screens or the robotic arms or the exoskeletons that are used. Uh, so we have named it computer game-based rehabilitation and not virtual rehab. Uh, here we use non-immersive computer games uh, while the patient is manipulating real-life objects in his hands. We wanted the patient to use real-life objects because we know, by and large, that sensory input, the type of sensory input that you give, be it the size of the object that the patient is holding, or the texture, or the density, or the shape of the objects, will definitely uh, change, in a way, the motor outcome that the uh, patient will produce, that you will produce in the patient through these activities. And that is why real-life objects. And this also, computer game-based therapy has been done in various forms, has good evidence, uh, give, showing improvements in wolf motor function tests and box and block tests, um, you, if you can uh, locate it on the forest plot. Uh, that is our setup, a simple laptop, a simple air mouse. If you can see, okay, <laughs> if you can see the small mouse here, he's holding a Pepsi can and a small mouse that is attached here. In this case, the small mouse on top over the ball. So this the first picture is to develop the spherical grasp. This one is for cylindrical grasp. This one for larger gross motor activities of the shoulder, of the elbow, etc. This picture is a little more clearer. So this is the motion mouse that we have developed with the University of Manitoba, which is an air mouse. Uh, it does not defy the laws of gravity, but it's just that it is wireless and it is mounted on various objects of daily living that the patient might use, uh, which you see in these um, uh, objects here um, for a tong grasp, for a three-jaw chuck grasp. I've shown majorly fine motor activities here, but there are gross motor activities as well that we use. And with these, with the mouse mounted on these objects, the patient is asked to play a simple game for assessment to take the baseline recordings and recordings at the 12th and the 16th week after treatment is given. Now the treatment, um, let, let me talk about the assessment game first. This is the assessment game, very simple. Uh, the movements of the patient in the environment is translated as 2D movements of this paddle that you see here. Sorry, of the paddle that you see here that either moves left or right depending on what movement the patient is doing. So if you want the patient, if you want to treat the patient in wrist flexion extension, you give him a ball, a soccer ball, he, uh, mount the air mouse either on the top or in the front depending on what movement you want. So if it's on the top, the movement the left and right movement of the wrist, which is flexion and extension, will be translated as the left and right movement of the paddle. Simple as that. So depending on what movements you want, these, these are just 2D activities. We can also do bimanual activities. We can also do single task rotatory activities as well, depending on where you place the mouse. So this makes a lot of, uh, you know, this gives way to a lot of modification and customizations that uh, we can do in the therapy protocol for the patient as per the patient's needs or as per the patient's uh, baseline motor test that we do. Mm. Yes, so this is uh, one typical uh, graph that we see. Uh, the first line you see here on top is a good response where the target is held. That's why you see the blue block here. And there is good latency period and good movement time seen. The one that is uh, red in color here, the last and third one, the movement, you see that the movement latency period is increased and the movement time is also increased and he has not grasped the uh, paddle as well. So apart from this, we also see various other uh, outcomes of the movement quality like success rate, response time, um, movement time, movement error and a lot of other things. 
Now that was of one single movement either to the left or the right. And all the movements during a, game to, during a one minute game is taken into consideration. Uh, and all the lefts and all the lights, the means and the standard deviations are taken into uh, consideration and to s uh, check uh, the before and after treatment. And this will be compared with already standardized scales like the Wolf motor function test, the stroke specific quality of life to see that if their participation has increased because of such an intervention. We do not use the same assessment game for intervention as well. The intervention games are varied. Here these are random off the shelf uh, games that we find online. Uh, so that the uh, problem of adaptability is dealt with. Um, like I said, we are seeing the feasibility and efficacy of this intervention program. The biggest uh, inclusion, in, uh, because of lack of time, I'm going to jump. I'm really sorry about that. These were the outcome measures. So the main issue that we s foresaw was recruitment. We assumed that by making a therapy efficient, cost efficient, by making it more interesting, we are going to have more patients come to us to get uh, therapy, uh, which is which so lacks in, in the Indian scenario. But more than 50% of the patients we saw were not willing to come regularly for a 12-week therapy session or even thrice a day, although the guidelines say that they have to come at least five times a week and, uh, and the various other uh, reasons as well. So what do we do about this? We know that supervised training sessions are necessary. That is the only way to go. We know that the therapy sessions need to be intensive, need to be repetitive. What do we do about it now? The probable inferences that we can make is a lack of awareness of uh, the effects of stroke rehabilitation. We have uh, numerous numbers of public awareness programs that are being made, but studies suggest that although there is an increase in awareness, the behavior is hardly impacted. We still don't see patients coming. Uh, second point, uh, I don't know if I should mention it, but I've put it up again because it is a real time problem. Awareness of and through the neurologists and physicians coming in contact with the patient is also poor. Indian studies have shown that only 20% of neurologists refer the cases for rehabilitation, which is again a very sad scenario. Stroke units are the evidence, uh, class one evidence to treat uh, stroke patients, but in India for a growing population, more than a billion, we have only 35 stroke units, out of which only nine include rehabilitation services. The PT patient ratio is stark, it's, it's huge. For every one PT, we have 25,000 patients that he need to take, needs to take care of. Versus a high income country like US, which has one is to 20, the ratio. So you see the stark difference there. Having experienced all these challenges, uh, we have come up with, um, of course, my trial, uh, uh, the reviewer assessed it yesterday and has given me his input, so I will be working on it. Um, the future implications that we are looking at here is um, applying tele-rehabilitation where we use online monitoring and online training systems uh, with the patient through a video conferencing or uh, some form of app that we are developing, and this uh, will be the second phase of the attend trial. Supervised home-based rehabilitation is a necessity. How do we do it? So we are working with the World Heart Federation and World Stroke Organization to employ more, uh, to, to come up with a, basically a white paper document to um, educate the government on the need for more number of physical therapists and any form of uh, rehabilitation workers at the government level, primary health care levels, so that the accessibility improves in these uh, rural areas. And the 80% of the population which is sitting at home can be treated with. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, okay let's thank uh, Dorcas. We move on to the next session.